Uh oh. Leave so, me. Yeah, then. we won our uh, won the church league game. I guess God loved us more than them because they're Methodist and wrong. Well, they also have meth in their name. I'm surprised they didn't crush you. Nah, well, they used to be like the dominant team in the league, and then I came on the scene, changed it everything up. You wow. alone? Well, I was part of it. We got a couple, a couple good guys. We're we're working on the three peat this year for the championship. We're somehow undefeated. We're six and zero. Oh. Even That's though we great. should have we should have lost today's game. We made like legit fifteen errors in the field and somehow we still won the game. <laughs> the other team must have been really methed out. Yeah. Well, they weren't hitting like they were methed out. We just kept getting them out. Hmm. So yeah, back to the initial point. God loves us more than them, apparently. You know, well, that's that's the line of you know of every medieval theologian. You know, God loves us more than them. Actually, really, throughout history, we don't have to confine it to the Middle Ages. You know, the God is different in the older stories, but, you know, the, the sentiment is the same. More yes. or less. Yes, that is pretty much the theme of most major wars. Yeah. You know, God loves us more. You have resources that we want. Get off my land. There's... Get off your land, too. <laughs> yeah, make, um, yeah, well, if you're the invading force, you know, go out. That's always been my, you know, historical conspiracy theory is that, you know, people just did war so much back then because there's nothing better to do. They I believe that. They couldn't go to the movie theater and see John Wick 4. You know, they couldn't play Call of Duty. So, you know, all that murderous anger and rage that we project digitally, people just went out and did it. And now we play video games and shoot characters yes. on our computer screens and yell at people on Twitter. Yes, and now it's come full circle as now the video games actually kill people. You know, you got some, you know, 19-year-old in Nevada with an Xbox controller firing Hellfire missiles from Predator drones. A Reaper drone, sorry. Predator. It's really confusing. Why do they call the, pre the recon drone the Predator? That sounds like something that would have a bomb on it. It does. The Reaper like, definitely says death more, though. Yeah, that's true. But still, like a predator, you think of something that kills things to survive. Yes. Like why did you call it like the? I, don't know, I guess they. I guess they went through all the birds. Well, if it's just for observation, couldn't they call it the creepy ex-boyfriend? Yeah, they could. They got uh, what's her name? Like the overly obsessed girlfriend. The meme. Yes. You know, memes and drones or effective drones have been around about as long as each other. I forgot about the overly affectionate girlfriend. Yeah, that was vintage internet. Mm, man, you know what I never liked and never understood was the ones with the character when and in the background it's like this sun ray effect. Yeah. I never liked those. Yeah, that was that was the cringier part of, you know, early meme culture. There was still some good ones like Bad Luck Brian is a classic. Yeah. I, I break that out every now and again just because, you know, I was one of the great old memes. And, you know, speaking of great old things on the internet, welcome to Off the Rails. Hell <laughs> with, yeah. With me and Aaron just sort of tiptoeing into that intro, we usually come crashing through the front door like a drunk driver trying to get away from the cops. Usually. Speaking of speaking of God's drunkest driver, that's a good meme. <laughs> I like that one a lot. Wait, what? Have you seen the God's drunkest driver meme? No. You might get into a little trouble because it's uh, it's somewhat edgy, I guess. Is this like a new? No, this is. I've seen this one on like every meme platform. It's it's here on YouTube. Let me see if I can. Find it. I'm I'm looking it up right now. No, no, you won't find it. I have to use my screen share for it. But it's worth it. Are you ready? I oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I got to my... I... We go through this every time, Aaron. I'm not doing it in Zoom. Come on, Zoom. I can't remember where I first saw this, but it was when I... it was so funny the first time I saw it. All right, <laughs> do like... it. Hit it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, 
That's it. <laughs> Sorry for all the people listening at home. You guys missed that. Oh, by the way, Aaron, this yeah. one's this one's going out to the public. Yeah. Oh, oh it I is. Was, I was gonna try to to trap you, like get you to say something really controversial, and oh, then be like, no. oh, by the way, this is the free one. Oh no! You I'm know, in I'm trouble. Getting, now. I get kind of tired. You know, we put all this effort into this show, and then you know, like two people get around to watching it out of like the seven or eight that are eligible to. Well, that's going to be trouble because that's licensed music and there's Hitler like doing a Sieg Heil. Well, the, you, you didn't that. have the music on. You didn't enable share sound. So there was Oh, no music. damn it. Oh, I wasted that screen share. It was still fun with the thing. <sighs> Speaking of screen sharing, we got to break out the whiteboard. Oh, yeah, let's do it. For all the other people, we have the whiteboard that I write things on and then Aaron reads them. I don't know why I feel felt the need to explain that. Oh, man. I feel like you guys probably could have figured out what we were doing on your own, but uh, yeah, here we are. This easel is definitely not up to the standards of the other one. It's not holding the board properly. Yeah, it's not. It's been fine. Oh, that's why. Okay. Wait a minute. Okay. I had it backwards. I have to tell you, I've been having connection issues with Zoom recently, so okay. if I pop out for like three or four seconds, I will come back, but just my apologies in advance to the listeners. Okay. So this week, instead of a funny saying, I did an entire poem. Oh, okay. Hold on, let me uh, switch the lights here so you can see it. The B-52 flies overhead, the Bombay doors open. You smile, sweet release at last. <laughs> <laughs> it's a relief I, to get exploded by a B-52? I mean, if you gotta go, there's definitely worse ways. There are worse ways. At least that would be I mean, quick. I mean, either way, it's cool, because the B-52 could be dropping a nuke, which, you know, badass. We haven't seen any of those in a while. Yeah. Or just it's just gonna carpet bomb the fuck out of like a couple mile radius, and you're they, if you're above if you can look up the Bombay doors, if you can look up the metaphorical skirt of the B fifty two. It's too late. Yeah, that's one of those. It's over for me. Kind yeah. Of moments. So that's that's you look up and you smile. It's like well, can't run. I imagine myself in this scenario out in like a, at a meadow, and I just look up and I just like sort of sit on my butt with like my hands behind my body looking up at the bombs coming down and I'm like thanks Joe Biden <laughs> why would Joe Biden bomb you in a meadow well he's the current president so I mean that that one we'll have to, we'll have to do this scenario again in a couple of years and see who's the president Oh, if somehow well, of course Joe Biden he may win a second term I hate that. I hate that that's possible. I mean, I, I hate that it's possible and probable. It's like, come on. Like, I get a lot of people voted for him, but like, who actually believes in? I don't even think Joe Biden believes it himself. He doesn't know where he is half the time. No, but it's just some weird, like, thing that the bad guys feel like they have to put us through. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh, your president is demented. Okay. Yeah, it's like they were saying, it's like, oh, well, the office of the president doesn't matter now, you know, like the, the company didn't crash and burn, you know, when one idiot had it, so we can have another one, and then, you know, Russia invades Ukraine. It's like, all right, well, maybe if we had someone who wasn't drooling on the button, maybe that doesn't happen. It doesn't feel like they're taking this very seriously, does it? It may, may I don't know, maybe it does. I mean, Putin probably, with the position <laughs> he's in, even before the war, you know, he kind of had to do something. It was one of those like shit or like the country collapses, get off the pot moments. Hmm. And now like he's just accelerated that. Like I was watching a stream of the Russian Victory Day Parade. One of the most pathetic things I've ever seen in my entire life. They had a Victory Day? Yeah. So it's like to celebrate the end of World War Two. Oh, OK. Well, victory in Europe. So they have this big, they've been doing it since 1945. They have, and that's when they display, you know, that's like when you see the footage of, you know, like the Soviet fighters flying overhead and the nukes rolling down Red Square and the tanks 
like that's usually footage from those parades. It's typically where Russia shows off everything it's been doing. You know, the, the five super tanks that they built, you know, are all just stored at the parade grounds and just like rolled down the street. Like, oh, look, we have T-14s. And this year I was watching the stream. You know how many tanks were in the parade? Five. One. <laughs> one, one refurbished T-34 with a Soviet oh. flag on the back of it. I think there was like 47 trucks, one portable nuke silo, and, you know, a few other like older vintage pieces. That was all of the equipment trundled out in this parade. It's supposed oh. to be like their biggest like day of the year. It's like a huge deal for them because, you know, they lost like 20 million people. So it makes sense. They want to celebrate the end of that war. And like most of the people marching were like legit children, like they were 16 year olds. Like they were not at all shaving. Like the uniforms are all baggy. They don't fit. Yeah, like it was terrible. Like if Putin was like, "Oh, we're gonna have this parade," you know, so the West doesn't think we're weak. Like it did the exact opposite of that. Huh. It's it, it's almost insane how far their military has shrunk in the past year. So they just literally have too many people in the field, or they're just all they dead? have nothing left. They're all most of their modern tanks are blown up. So they're taking T-55s out of the factory and refurbishing them, slapping some... Because that's where, like, the meme comes from of, like, the three soldiers, like, looking sheepishly at something. I don't know if you've seen that. No. So it's called, like, the e ERA gang. The meme is that the Russians always put ERA on, like, literally everything in their vehicles. So it's just, like... Um, it's just making fun of that. It's just people just posting era things on things that don't but um okay to... forgive my ignorance what does era mean explosive reactive armor what does that even what the hell is that it's the armor they put on tanks so when a shell hits it it's a ceramic plate with a charge in it and it bl essentially blows up the penetrator and doesn't allow it to get in in theory huh because mo most anti-tank shells, the round is only about this big. I'm holding up a two-sided Expo marker. It's it's literally a dart. It's just fired at super sonic speeds. And hmm. it gets really hot, and then it just punches a hole in the tank and tries to blow up something inside the tank, either fuel or ammunition. Interesting. Which, you know, the Russians are infamous for their tanks exploding because, one, they don't have self-contained blowout fuel tanks and they put all their ammunition in the turret we were actually we actually covered that a few episodes ago i remember we were watching the the videos of the tops of the russian tanks blowing off like 100 oh, feet yeah. in the air yeah because yeah, they put all their ammunition around the gun that people are shooting at that seems like a bad idea so yeah one of those super hot darts hits the tank and uh boom town well, I don't know if I have an opinion about whether or not a military parade is a good thing, but that is interesting to hear that it was pathetic. Yeah, well, because they they've lost all their vehicles. Like they're conscripting civilian trucks and buses to haul ammunition to the front. It's like Dunkirk, but yeah, the worse. opposite. They're defending their own country, and they still can't defend. They've been trying to take this one town for like three months now. It looks like the town of Verdun in World War One. Like the whole town is like leveled. They've been fighting for months, and this is like the closest place that the Russians can resupply on the front, and they still can't push through this one little tiny pocket of resistance. So That's everybody's really we're all waiting for the Ukrainian counteroffensive. You know, they've been hyping it up all winter long. It's, it's finally getting to the time in Russia where the mud disappears a little bit and, you know, you can have a big offensive. And people have been trying to figure out where that's going to be going forward. Hmm. Well, I mean, I feel bad, but I've ch I've kind of checked out of the whole thing because I don't even know. I mean, it's wartime news. I, I don't even know what to believe. So, yeah, but if you look at just like what's hap actually happening on the ground, not the news around it, like if you follow the actual 
military events. It's actually the most fascinating conflict of the 21st century. Really? Yeah, because you have what was assumed to be the world's second most powerful military utterly collapsing to take a country that has no real natural defenses. I mean, Ukraine is mostly just flat plains and some woodland. You know, there was supposed to be this big armored offensive. You know, this was the thing that was going to push through the Fulda Gap and drive all the way to the English Channel. And well, for one, they're using the same tanks that they were trying to use back then to do that. And two, you know, the, their army has crumbled. They took a third of Ukraine and then lost most of it. It's just been spectacular just how incompetent the Russian military has become in the since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And we can watch yeah. that in real time. Yeah, that is interesting. I that is in, that is interesting now that you put it like that. It's like if it weren't for like honestly, the biggest thing you can take away from this whole conflict is it's the greatest case for nuclear weapons ever made. Because hmm. if it weren't for nukes, Poland would be driving tanks into Moscow right now behind a NATO advance. But, you know, there's a the nuclear war angle, so we don't do that. Yeah. So wh how does this end, do you think? Does this look like anything else in history? I mean, it looks like plenty of wars in history. It's just... It's on... Uh, eventually... If it goes on long enough, eventually the Russian government will collapse. There'll be some kind of coup. Um, there's a possible peaceful settlement to this. You know, maybe if the Ukrainians try to throw a counteroffensive and it doesn't go as well as the last one, maybe the the line sort of it's kind of like the Iran Iraq war. They just sort of go into the territory and then come back, and then it sort of like zigzags back and forth, and then the borders just stay the same. Hmm. Uh, well, the best possible scenario for Ukraine would be to retake the territory the Russians have to have now, plus Crimea. But um, that's a whole different nut entirely. Aren't the Ukrainians wearing thin as well, though? I mean, yeah, but they have enough people, and people want to continue to fight. And as long as they keep getting these big arms shipments from the West, they can just keep pounding the Russians until there's nothing left. Hmm. You know, people, you know, complain. It's like, oh, we sent 40 billion to Ukraine. Do you know how expensive the Iraq war was? It was like two trillion dollars. So, you know, a couple hundred billion to defeat your pretty much greatest geopolitical rival on the world's chessboard is a deal. Now all we got to worry about is China, and they're about 10 years away from collapse, too. So as long as we can last another decade, we'll have no one at the top but us or even anywhere close to the top really yeah hmm. i'm where are you getting your information i'm curious because i don't know where to look anymore i i follow this one guy his, his name is like peter zine zine or zine Han. he does a lot of like pretty balanced politically anyway like geopolitical events uh, i follow some like uh war youtubers who ordinarily make like videos about you know like world war ii or whatever but like recently, you know, Ukraine's the hot button thing. So they all do things on Ukraine. There's this one podcast. It's called NAFO, even rounder table. Like the one guy's a tank guy. One guy's a plane guy. One of them's like a geopolitics guy. And like another one's like a different kind of like, so they all have like their different specialties and they all get together and just like laugh at Russia for three hours. That sounds funny. Like that's actually, that's where I watched the parade from. Like they were live streaming it. And like, it was a three hour stream and the parade was like a half an hour long. So like, I've seen like regular civilian parades in America that it went longer than this. And this is supposed half to be like the, their biggest event of the year. There's a bunch of children marching, one tank, 47 trucks and an ICBM. That was it. There was no flyover. They said the weather was bad, even though it was clear blue skies because they don't have any planes left. And what planes they do have left, they don't have the pilots who know how to fly them because they can't get their flight hours. Because they're either they don't have the fuel for them or they're just being shot down. Hmm. To me, like I said, it's it's fascinating to watch. Well, I'm glad somebody's having a good time watching it because 
I guess I didn't know where to look, but I also I follow a couple like combat footage things on Reddit. And that's some grisly shit. Like that's some you see like the death and destruction up close. Like a lot of it is just like Toys R Us level drones dropping grenades on people and killing them. Yeah, I've seen those. Like they've gotten really good at that. Like there's some of those guys that can just like drop a grenade in an open hatch of a tank and blow it up. From a drone? From a drone, yeah. It's usually abandoned vehicles, but all the hatches are open anyway, so they're just trying to destroy it so they can't reclaim it. But I mean, still, he flies a drone, you know, from however far above and drops a grenade in the hatch from, you know, however many feet with That's no real impressive. way to aim it aside from just basic intuition. That's pretty I guess, impressive. I guess it's kind of like learning strange. how to shoot a bow, like without a, like without sights. It's like a free bow. Like, I guess eventually you just sort of like know where in the sky to aim to put the arrow where you want it. Yeah. Except this is a tiny robot with propellers dropping a explosive like grenade yeah. into a tank from the sky. I mean, war is getting so crazy. Yeah. Do you think do you think it's going to be like the Do you think it's really going to be like just like in the future it's going to be all drones and robots or do you always have to have people on on the ground? I mean, it all depends how good we get at making robots. It may, how good we can make robots at killing people, and then how much we trust said robots to not kill us, Terminator style. That's true. You know, but you know they're going to try it. I mean, they're already these. You know, that's what's funny about this this scientific culture we're living in now is like we've figured out we can do some shit, and we never anymore ask should we. Yeah, <laughs> we just do it. It's like suddenly we have AI everywhere, and everyone's like, it's too late. It's like, wh why did it have to happen? I guess it's like the nuclear arms race a little the, bit. It's like, because well, the, the they're going to do it. The new wave in AI is it's taken into aviation now. Which, you know, I, I had a, a buddy in the Air Force. He's like, oh, it'll never happen. And then two years later, here we are. So the idea is it's almost like a flock of seagulls approach. So you have... Actually, Adana, did you ever play that board game Stratego before? No. Okay, so basically you set up, you have a bunch of different units that are all like valued. So it's kind of like chess. You know, you have a bunch of like pawns that are worth one, like a general that's worth like 10. And you set them up and your opponent can't see them and you have to guess and attack. So it's like, all right, you move this here. It's a, a 3.1. You're hoping for one that can beat. If it's a 10 there, then your guy loses. And you try to capture the flag. But anyway, so the principle of what the Air Force is planning, I'll just draw it out here on the whiteboard, is a one-man strike fighter that's stealth surrounded by drones. So I use red here for our, our main plane. And then he's got drone here a 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 drone here so when the enemy radar sees it it lights up with all these different things and they got to try to you know maybe this is the real one so they're playing stratego like which one in this formation is the one i'm looking at and so they shoot their sam boom we killed this oh it's a drone there's the strike one boom he dropped his bomb and killed everybody it's essential we've been doing something similar to this a long time is just now we can do it with drones like we did it in vietnam too we would fly a really fast plane low and then it would come up into an area where we know sam batteries were the sams would light up ping it with radar and then shoot it and then the slower fighters that were unseen before would see the now lit up sam batteries and then drop bombs on them and then the path is clear for everybody else that's amazing it's essentially that, but with drones now. And how far are these drones from the main craft? I mean, they're like a flying formation. Okay, so they're not that far away. Yeah, okay. like a Blue Angels demonstration almost. Wow. But, you know, they can switch it up. So, you know, the next time they go, maybe the strike fighter's there, and we got drones here, 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 and one in the middle. So, oh, okay, the, the guy was in the middle last time. Let's blow him up while well, the, the real one's over here. It's a, it's a way to try to overwhelm the systems of the enemy to get the mission done. Hmm. 
because once they get a lock on it's you know despite what the movies tell you it's kind of hard to escape that modern anti-aircraft missiles have gotten very good and that's part of the problem you know that that's how the russian air force is still unable to control the skies of ukraine because if they fly any more than like right past the front lines they're getting blown out of the sky by shoulder launched sam missiles or battery fired sams and they just don't have the planes to lose anymore so a lot of times they actually lob missiles like they'll fly the plane up on an angle and then shoot the missile like up in the air to get it more arc so it can just stay completely out of sam range but it also means, you know, maybe your missile hits a school or a school bus full of children. Which, you know. Sucks. Sucks. It makes things politically very, very difficult when you have things like that happening. But I guess war is politically incorrect, isn't it? Yep. Today's show brought to you by Arby's. I was going to say, do you get paid for this sponsorship? Arby's. Maybe it'll be good. At least it's not McDonald's. <laughs> Arby's is like the most inconsistent menu of like any fast food chain ever. Like every time you go in there, there's like 15 new things on the menu. Well, I only ever order the one thing. I mean, if I work there, sure, I'd try different things. But you go to Arby's for the roast beef sandwich. Yeah, I knew you were a roast beef and cheese kind of guy. No, not even cheese. Just straight roast beef. What kind of... Mm. I know, it's disgusting. But that's yeah. how I ate them when I was a kid. So whenever I have Arby's now, I'm like... I just don't want to try any of this other weird looking you stuff. You gotta try the try the smoked mountain sandwich. It's like that, but it's got barbecue sauce and onion rings on it. That sounds incredible. Unfortunately, I'm trying to I'm trying to not eat fast food anymore. It's sad, but it's. It is I, don't, I do it a lot with salt. Even if I eat before the game, like after softball, I'm just hungry on the way home. I'm like uh, that's what I did today. I was on the way back from my game. I was like, Arby's is there. Mm. It's probably going to be better than the Burger King. Yeah. And significantly faster. If there's like more than like two cars in the drive through there, I just keep on driving. Like I'm going to be there for half an hour. I'll just go home and throw an instant burger patty on the grill. Because they're slow. And they're the ones that want $15 an hour. So you guys, do, you guys don't buttons. have uh, Culver's out there, do you? I've heard of it before, but I've never seen one. Ah, it's quality trash. Like it's it's the highest end fast food that I can think of outside of like Chick Fil A. The big one here is Wawa. Yeah, it's like Wawa. a it's like a convenience store, but they well they initially it used to just be a deli. You could get like sliced lunch meat, and then they realized they could started selling hoagies, and that sort of became like their whole or subs. I don't know. Maybe that's a Midwestern thing. I don't know what you guys call them out there. Subs. Subs, yeah. Fucking weirdos. You call it pop too, or is it soda? Uh soda, I think. You think? You see he doesn't want to know because he's I don't really order it. I, I don't order soda, man. I see? Okay, it is soda. I don't order crack either, but I know what it's called because I've heard about it. <laughs> 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 what is like? I'm trying now. I'm trying to think of like the most midwestern thing that I've heard. I mean, it's it's to it depends on what part of the Midwest you're talking about. If you're talking about Indiana, there is so much weird shit that goes on there linguistically. Like for example, they don't call it soda or pop; they call it Coke. Yeah, I'll have a Coke, and they're like, "What kind of Coke?" And you're like, "Sprite." <laughs> I mean, technically, Coca Cola does own Sprite, so they're well, not completely incorrect. The Hoosiers are red pilled on soda. Speaking of drinks that people get red pilled on, uh -oh. have you been participating in this uh, this Bud Light boycott? I mean, I don't drink beer, so right. And even so, before Bud Light did this, I did not drink Bud Light. But everyone was going, but you can't just boycott Bud Light. Yeah. You have to boycott InBev or whatever the hell it's called. Anheuser Busch is the one that owns all of them. Yeah, Anheuser Busch. I don't know. That makes like thirty percent of like they make Coors Light, Miller Light, Bud Light, Budweiser, um, and a couple of the other ones too. I think maybe it's like a couple of the other Milwaukee ones. Like um, what's the one? I think Keystone Light is owned by them. Yeah, I think so. 
which is I always thought it was funny. It's like it's the college beer because it's cheaper. I was like, it's two more dollars for a thirty pack of Miller Lite. Like you really couldn't afford that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like come on, guys. I mean, maybe over the course of the year you save a hundred bucks, which I mean I guess isn't insignificant, but to drink shittier beer. I just don't get light beer. I've never understood it. I mean, it's good I, at like a baseball game. I drank it because that's you know what a lot of pe. I grew up around a lot of old people, so that's what they drink. And then I I branched out. I got into like wheat beers a lot. Hmm. Like blue Blue Moon's probably the like if I was ordering one at a restaurant and I want something a little nicer, I would go Blue Moon because that's like everybody has it. It's pretty good. You throw an orange slice in there. It's a nice little special occasion. But uh, I stopped drinking beer like three years ago. That was a good call. It really always made call. me feel like shit. Yeah. And I can get away with drinking <laughs> a lot more liquor and cocktails. And I generally, I mean, I might feel like shit the next day, but at least that night I was still able to party. Right. I mean, I'm all about partying. Well, I, I would, you know, all the time see people at gas stations with those 30 packs of Bud Light, and now I just don't see it at all. I'm like, it's all, everyone's like switching. And I'm like, so why did they want to kill Bud Light in particular? Were they just tired of making it? <laughs> I I think it's sort of like an echo chamber kind of thing. You know, marketing comes up with this thing and it's a bunch of old dudes in a boardroom. They're like, oh, the young people will love this. Forgetting to take into account like all the not young people that drink Bud Light, which is their primary market. I don't know how you make a mistake like this unless it's intentional. It looks, it, I mean, I've heard people saying it's a something with to do with stocks. They're going to drive it down and then buy it up and then Maybe. blow it up again. I don't know. Wouldn't surprise me. I just think uh, people are out of touch. I think this is a, a a symptom of like the echo chamber style of the internet. It's like, oh, let's hire some you know savvy internet people. We spend all our time on Reddit, you know, circle jerking each other in their echo chambers. And it's like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, a trans advocate for Bud Light, you know, that would be huge on Reddit. That would get tens of thousands of upvotes, not taking into account all the people not on Reddit because, yeah. you know, they don't interact with them on a daily basis. So what do they know? They know what they see on Reddit or they see on the news. And it's like, oh, those people, you know, they'll, you know, whatever we say, they'll just keep buying our product. So I Apparently started playing. Not. I started playing Far Cry Five again, and I think I'm from now on going to imagine that the cultists are just redditors. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Now that they were way too in shape to be redditors. This is true. Your average redditor. I mean, I'm to embrace the meme. I'm like the most healthy redditor for sure. Except and, for all the you know women that post all their nudes on there, I guess they're equally as healthy as me, body wise anyway. Potentially, I don't know. Do they all play as much softball as you do? No, no one does. Well, I not say no one, but I did at one point have every a game every day this week, and now well Wednesdays got moved, but so Wednesday was my one day off this week of softball. I have a game every other day of the week. Pretty busy. Yeah, it keeps me from thinking about, you know, my bitch ex girlfriend and keeps you from thinking about that B fifty two in the meadow. That's I that's what it wants me. I'm out the meadow could be a baseball field. You know, that way I kill two birds with one stone. Getting killed in an explosion, playing softball. Love it. I want to do it right now. I'll get Biden on the phone and see yeah. if it can be arranged. I'll just stand out in the middle of a field with like a fuck Joe Biden sign pointed to the sky and just wait. I, I'm here, old man. Come get me, you coward. <laughs> I'm bullying trans youth and I don't know, reading the Bible. I guess it upsets them. I don't know. I don't know what. Yeah, I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, what? what could you say to Biden? Like, come get me. I'm you not drinking my bitch. corn starch. He might, he might, yeah, I forgot to eat my corn syrup. Um, he might just have you killed, like assassinated. No glory, no nothing. It yeah. just, oh, that guy, that guy, he just seems to me that kind of shady son of a bitch. I don't know. Joe Biden, if you're listening, don't Please. send assassins. Blow me up like a man. 
<laughs> we spend all this tax money. I mean, the bomb is probably paid with my tax dollars anyway, which I'm okay with. You know, if I got a receipt after I turned in my taxes, it's like, hey, we, you know, built part of a, you know, Reaper drone with your taxes. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I so, paid for it, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Give me this my, is my bomb. War. I <laughs> that was um from the did you ever see the movie Charlie Wilson's War or read the book? Uh They're both really good. sounds it's got really Tom funny. Hanks, Julia Roberts, Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's a great movie. Uh... About the congressman who funds the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. I did he, not see that. No, he took but, the he took the black approach budget for that war from five million to a billion in like three years. And he used to visit Afghanistan, or he used to visit Pakistan and talk to the Afghanis on the other side of the border. And then his last trip there, he they let him go into the country, and they was gonna like he wanted to shoot one of the guns, and they wouldn't let him. He says, "This is my war. I paid for it." I want to take part in it. So they let him shoot one of the anti-aircraft cannons a couple times. That sounds like a good, like, I mean, you might as well. That's what we're talking about, isn't yeah. it? Our tax dollars are going toward bombs. Right. We should get a bomb at the softball field. Yeah, Send me a picture of a bomb with my name written on a Sharpie. That's all. <laughs> That's all I ask for. You give me that, I stop complaining about the government at least 17%. 17% reduction if I get a Sharpie image of a bomb with my name on it. Any Is active it... military people out there, you can do this. Like they're, you're not going to get in trouble for it. Just put it where nobody notices. What are they going to say? Oh, this bomb doesn't work. It's got Neil Eckert written on it. And if anything, it makes it more effective. What, it's to have like, the name Neil yeah, Eckert like, on it? Yeah, it's like putting, a, it's like putting a, a rune on the weapon. It makes it more powerful. It absorbs my chaotic energy. And maybe, you know, the shrapnel hits, you know, 5% better. Maybe what they need to do is first obliterate you, then gather up the ashes and put that in a bomb. That would be fucking hardcore. Turn it to a, like, yes. ma make it into an ink and get, like, a magic marker, and you can... I like where your head's at, Aaron. I'm liking <laughs> it. Keep it. Keep feeding me. Yes. Uh, Sharpie, Neil Eckert edition. Yeah. Maybe, like, maybe you could, like, wet the ashes down and, like, harden them so, like, my ashes are kind of, like, extra shrapnel. Yes. That'd be pretty cool. I, it would Bullets probably made it would from your ashes. It would probably disintegrate when, when the high explosive goes off, but, you know, a man can dream. Damn, that sounds like a really cool way to be buried now. Speaking you know, to the same people I'm asking to write my name on a bomb. You know how Hunter S. Thompson went out, right? I've heard stories. Like There's a lot of like legends about that guy. They uh they fired his ashes from a cannon while the Star Spangled Banner played. Yeah, that's hardcore. <laughs> I'll uh, I that that works too. I mean, it doesn't have to be a bomb. I'll take a cannon. Shoot, put me in like a siege gun, like a there you go, like an 18th century siege mortar. Fire me into the air like a one last pop fly for Neil <laughs> out of a cannon. Fuck, that's cool. Yeah, we, we can make You're this a happen. good idea machine tonight, Aaron. Keep them coming. I'm doing my best. Usually it's me who comes up with the crazy ones, but the, today you're, you're getting in the groove. I like where your head's at mentally. Well, you've got me for maybe the next 10 minutes before my head explodes. I'm, I, I'm not on camera because I'm not feeling very good right now. But uh, maybe the maybe the the body pain that I feel from whatever this illness is, maybe it's stimulating an unused part of my brain to come up with strange things. Maybe I mean maybe whatever I it is, one, I like it. I like it, it's working. I should be the one writing the whiteboard prompt, even though all of my ideas are based yeah. on that. Give me a what? I'll write it. You say something, I'll write it on there. I got the marker right here. Okay. Marker yeah. is ready. Give me a. Let's, let's give me do something. It. Ah, uh, uh, I'm running out of steam. Or hold on, let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Just get the white whiteboard ready. I'll come up with something. I, I've the whiteboard is cocked and ready, Aaron. <laughs> don't you worry. <laughs> I am ready. I got oh. a cap in one hand. I'm ready to pull like the pin on the grenade and just unleash your ideas onto the world, like a like an idea <sighs> cum shot. Just <laughs> there it is, all over. The audience's face.
what but if they're into it? They're into it. <laughs> they're into it. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, I don't know. I you guys, uh, you guys, if you press the play button, you consented to whatever Aaron and I are doing to your ears currently. You're staying here. You're yes. listening to this. You could, you could have left at any time, but you chose to stay. So now you accept the consequences. I don't want to see any bad reviews. Oh, after the 47 minute mark, you know, Neil's rant about the Antichrist, you know, unsubbed. I don't want to hear it. You were warned. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to hear about the Antichrist from you, honestly? Well, I've been like reading a lot of like turn of the millennium histories, and they're all obsessed with the end of the world because they thought like the first millennium is going to be the end of it. So I've been hearing a lot about the Antichrist imminent arrival a thousand years ago. <laughs> imminent. He's Daily any minute expected. now. Yeah. Just two more weeks. <laughs> Cause I, part of the, one of the stories I've been using is the forge of Christendom by Tom Holland. Pretty great book. And it's like a general overview of like everything that's been going on. So it's not great. as like a single research source for any one topic, but it helps like put the whole story into perspective. This shows you like how everything is going on at once. I didn't realize and, Tom Holland was a writer. No, it's a historian, not Spider-Man. Oh, different. I'm kidding. Tom I'm... Holland. Okay. I didn't know if you know. <laughs> I know a guy who looks just like him. We call him Tom Holland. <laughs> really funny. So um, there's like all these different things. It's like all of these stars are supposed to align. And he keeps saying like Antichrist did not appear. And actually, you know what? I'm probably going to get in trouble for doing this, but fuck it. What are you doing? I'm just going to play the end of the audiobook. I the guy I had that he has to narrate is James A. Gillis. I want to find more books narrated by him because like he he puts on like an Emmy wor or whatever award worthy performance. A like, blue ribbon performance. This is about the end of the First Crusade. ...and the Christian people transformed utterly. The arrival of the Crusaders before the walls of the Holy City was merely a single, albeit the most spectacular, manifestation of a process which since the convulsive period of the millennium had made of Europe something restless and dynamic and wholly new. Nor would it be the last. A thousand years had passed now since an angel, parting the veil which conceals from mankind the plans of the Almighty for the future, had given to St. John a revelation of the last days. And the saint writing it down had recorded how a great battle was destined to be fought, and how the beast at its end would be captured and thrown into a lake of fire. But before that could be brought about, and the world born anew, Christ himself clad in a robe dipped in blood was destined to lead out the armies of heaven. From his mouth issues a sharp sword with which to smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On 15th July, the Crusaders finally broke into Jerusalem and took possession of the object of all their yearnings. The wine press was duly trodden. The streets were made to flow with blood. And at the end of it, when the slaughter was done, and the whole city drenched in gore, the triumphant warriors of Christ, weeping with joy and disbelief, assembled before the sepulchre of the Saviour, and knelt in an ecstasy of worship. Meanwhile, in the Temple Mount, where it had been foretold that Antichrist would materialize at the end of days, enthroned in fearsome and flame-lit glory, all was stillness. The slaughter upon the rock of the Temple had been especially terrible and not a living thing had been left there to stir. Already in the summer heat, the corpses were starting to reek. Antichrist did not appear. And that's how he ends it. That was incredible. Yeah. I said, he's, he's a good writer, and the guy reading it, too, is fantastic. Like, the whole book is like that. Like, he just, like, throws himself into that performance. I love it when you can find a good audiobook reader. Oh, I, I have, especially like on things that it's great when there's like a popular book where like a bunch of people have done audiobooks, so you get to choose. But like sometimes you just get like stuck with someone who's just dog shit. You know who I've never liked? Um, 
for audiobooks is any celebrity. Yeah, I don't I don't read celebrity books, so I, I don't either, but sometimes you'll get like a classic that's like narrated by, you know, some big wig yeah, like James Tom Hanks Earl or Jones something. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know. I like that there is a world of audiobook readers who are just like really good and are not celebrities. I want to see, I want to hear the Bible read by Mark Hamill. That and I want him to do awful. And I want him to do voices because he, like, most of his career has been voice acting. Can you imagine, like, if he's, like, doing, like, a point of view, like, the devil, and he's, like, using the Joker voice? I mean, because he can do a bunch of different voices. So I'd be kind of curious to see, like, how he would, you know, if he did, like, a full on, like, acting performance of it. I mean, not that Mark Hamill seems to be to read the Bible, but, you know. Did you ever see Andy Serkis doing the screw tape letters? No. Dude, you'd love that. Full performance does have a good monologue voice. Like he doesn't get used as often as he should. Yeah, but he plays demons in the book, different yeah. kinds of demons, and he's amazing. Yeah, he's His an incredible are... actor. He's been robbed of an, an a, award for far too long. I'm definitely on the train to give um, Circus his Oscar. Yeah, well, um... especially in well, he might. I, I think I don't know if he did or not, but he should have won an Emmy for Andor. I just rewatched that yesterday. And he gives this like speech in the middle of it. And it's absolutely fantastic. Like you just like he he's one of those guys that just like throws himself completely into performance. You know what it's I like, finally speaking of TV, you know what I finally finished? What? Better Call Saul. Did you? How'd yeah. you like it? Oh my gosh, it's the best show I've ever seen in my life. Every episode was amazing. I kinda I wasn't a huge fan of the second half of the end of the, the last season. The first half of the the last season was incredible but I, I i guess i just i kind of don't find you know gene takovic that interesting i was like why are we spending so much time yeah i definitely think that the second half was weaker but god the first half oh my gosh some of the best television ever yeah seriously I mean, it, all, all in all i think for one it's better than breaking bad as a show i think I, a lot of people are like oh breaking bad's better but i think that the writers learned a lot of lessons doing Breaking Bad that they avoided a lot of pitfalls that hit them. You know, if you look at like Better Call Saul, there's a lot of stuff that's not just like luck based. You know, so many of like Walter White's schemes just work because of blind luck. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of like it takes you out of the story. Whereas like with Better Call Saul, it's like it's his skill is what's getting him out of all of these like potholes he keeps hitting. Yeah. And I think like when you have uh best villains competing in the same show like all of the villains in that show were awesome oh yeah of course and they were you know going head to head with their performances and i think lalo ended up being my absolute favorite mm -hmm. but it was like i mean it they they set it up perfectly to have all of these excellent little moments and you know this is rare for me like for those of you who don't listen to this Neil's asking me, what are you watching all the time? And I'm like, I don't watch anything because Nothing. I'm so cynical. Uh, I freaking love Better Call Saul. It's one of the best shows I've ever seen. That and Stargate SG-1. Yeah. I've been, I'm doing a rewatch <laughs> of um, Mad Men again. That one, that kind of fell off towards the end. But that, there's still, like the early seasons are some of the best stuff on TV. Didn't you can, de you can Men... definitely tell that Matt Weiner was like one of the, the funny one in the Sopranos writer's room. Because like a lot, a lot of the comedic charm of The Sopranos is definitely evident in, in Mad Men. Didn't Mad Men get affected by the first writer strike? It's possible. Yeah, because I felt like I was watching a a YouTube. I was watching a YouTube today. Yeah, okay, and somebody was, com somebody was commenting on the writer strike, and I was hearing some of the same like rhetoric I heard back then of like these people need jobs and they need to be fairly compensated for their work. Um, and I was just like, which, Man, is, true. This, which is true. Uh, and then the other thing he said was, um, the he pointed out how bad the quality of television became during the writer's strike. And I was reminded of like being subjected to like more reality TV and lower quality, um, dramas and thrillers and such.
Yeah. Now they're just getting to the point where they're just working them to death. Like if you're a writer for Disney, like there's no vacation. Like you've got to crank out the 15th Star Wars episode this week. And like it's gotten to the point like where they, they're rushing it so much, like even like their big outing movies and TV shows, they look terrible because, you know, they're not taking the time to refine it. They're just like, we got a, a threadbare story, slap it onto some half ass sheet CGI and then put it out. People want content. We got to keep won't people know any subscribed different. to Disney Plus. Yeah, they won't know any different. And then the book of Boba Fett came out and everyone was just like openly mocking how bad it was. Yeah. It was well, just it was such a wasted opportunity. That like I had all the makings of a great show and then it just shit the bed. Like a lot of people make fun of it because like it shows like after he climbs out of the Sarlacc pit, like he spends a few episodes with the Tuscan Raiders and like he's the only one talking because all they do is like grunt and do sign language. But like I found I that was the most interesting part of the show. It's kind of like dances with wolves, but with sand people <laughs> and Boba Fett or sorry, Tuscan Raiders can't say sand people these days. I guess not. And it was interesting because like it, it kind of humanized characters in Star Wars that have always just been like automatic bad people. Like, oh, they attacked Luke and they broke the speeder and they shot at Anakin in the pod race and Anakin committed a mini genocide on them. That helped yes. propel him to the dark side. Like the sand people are always bad. And this time it's like, oh, these are just people who were living on their land that like were kind of fucking over. That's classic Disney. Yeah. Let's make the bad guy the good guy. Wow. Maleficent too. Well, I, it works in this case though. Oh, I'm for I'm fine with that kind of thing. It's just they're, ugh, I'm so tired of Disney. I'm sorry. I'll shut it, up. It fits. I mean, if you think about it, it kind of fits. I'm going to nerd out on Star Wars here a little bit. Uh, it fits canonically because all the examples I mentioned, like, they're not really inherently bad things they're doing. Like, it's not like Maleficent where it's like, oh, we see the character doing like blatantly evil things. And it's like, oh, now I want to be good. And you think about it. Yeah. They're having a NASCAR ride in the middle of these people's backyard. I'm going to shoot at them too. You know, I'll put on a little <laughs> gas mask and say, er, er, and shoot out the window. Fuck it. So, you know, it's understandable. So, you know, when they sh actually show them up close when they're not shooting at people, it's like, oh, they're just like normal, like tribal people who like to eat desert fungus. <laughs> That's the thing that they dig it up. It's like a, it's like a, a mushroom and that they break it open and it has water in it. And that, explains how the people on Tatooine drink water in the desert. I thought they farmed it with moisture capture. Well, they do that too, but like, so we're getting real deep into the, the iceberg here. Tatooine used to be a water planet and then it got like glassed in one of the wars and like they just they killed all the life on the planet except for the Jawas and the Tuscans who evolved and put on clothes. Because they used to be like in the water, so they don't dry out. They have to like wrap themselves in sheets and stuff, supposedly. I didn't know any of that. Yeah, I'm a, a bit of a Star Wars nerd, despite how many times Disney tries to break my heart. <laughs> you hold on with pure yeah. resolve. Because occasionally they put out something decent, so I just wait for the reviews to come in. I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna skip this. I'm gonna skip this. And like all these like video essays were like creaming themselves over Andor. I was like, I'm gonna watch it, and I creamed myself too. So I was like, all right, that was a good recommendation. Yeah, you have been pretty consistent on your love for Andor. Yeah, even on the uh, there's a couple couple of things on the rewatch that, that were kind of boring to me, but all in all, it's still a great it's a great story. It's got a great plot. Like the world, the world building is great. It doesn't look cheap. Like you can tell they spent three years making this, which kind of worries me about the second season because it's like, all right, now people know they want this. They're going to rush the second one, and it's probably not going to be as good. And then they'll cancel it for no reason. Yeah, the same thing happened to The Mandalorian. Like The first season of Mandalorian was great. And then the second season, it was you could, you could tell it was rushed, and like half of the season was just introing characters for all the other 20 projects they're trying to put out. It's, oh, look, here's this blatant cameo for this person, so we can see where they are when we do their side series. It's about the universe of films, not the individual films. Yeah. 
and now I haven't even th- seen the third season, but I heard it's not fantastic. Mm. So you just can't have anything good these days, you know. Just doomed to milk every IP to death, and it's what? kind of our fault. Why we, we keep we watching? We enabled it? this activity, yeah. Because I was thinking about the other day about like going to the movies. I'm like, well, I only go to the movies when I know like something I know I want to see. And I see like movies advertised all the time. Like, oh, that might be interesting. But I'm like, do I really want to go see it? I could just, just wait. I might want. I might see that um, that Sisu movie or something like that. It was made by the Sisu. guys who did John Wick about like the guy killing Nazis in Scandinavia or whatever. I haven't seen that. No, I've seen ads for it. Something funny. I, I was watching a little Red Letter Media the other day. They mentioned this phenomenon that I'd never seen before of people going to a movie, watching the whole movie, and then like going into another theater in the building and like watching the second half of another movie. You've never heard of theater hopping before? I've never heard of that. Oh, I my dad used to plan it out. He'd be like, oh, yeah, we're going to go to this one. And then, you know, this gives us 20 minutes. We can just sneak into the other theater. Especially now, theater employees don't give a fuck. Like, they, I mean, they never really did care that much. But, like, now that, like, the movie theater industry is dying, they're just like, yep, we're selling tickets at the concession stand. We're not going to check it. Just find your seat and deal with it. Yeah. And they just don't care anymore. Which is a shame because, you know, I always enjoyed going to the movie theaters. But at the same time, I also enjoy sitting in my bed and not having to go out in public and deal with people talking in the movies or spending $15 to see something. Yep, which is why which is why we're podcasters. We yeah. hate everything out there in the world so we stay inside and talk to each other through microphones and make content that hopefully doesn't suck as much as a lot of the mainstream stuff. Do you ever just like listen to TV shows like not watch them, just listen. Yes, we used to do that. Like I, I do it all. Like I only really do it with like shows that I've seen. Like I'll be like working or whatever, and I'll have it like on in the background. Like I'll glance at it every now and again. But like I, I just like to listen to how people's voices, because like when you don't see like the body language and everything that's going on, you can really like pick apart what people are saying. And like I've tried, at least I've tried to adapt it into like how I perform the podcast. It's like trying different like vocal techniques that I've seen other people do and like things that I like. I'm like, all right, let me try that. Let me try to like this this form of inflection or this way of like building up and then pulling back and then hitting again. I don't know, maybe I'm just weird. You're not weird. I I've done that too. I am. Oh well, maybe, yeah, okay, maybe, yeah. Maybe not let's in hold this up. Specific your, case. your dream is being bombed by Joe Biden in a meadow. Okay. Yeah. That's well, doesn't that, let me be clear. It doesn't have to be Joe Biden. I'll take any president or someone with the authority to drop bombs on me. Well, if Biden's flying the plane, the plane might run into you, and that'd be significantly <laughs> more epic than just getting bombed. And it's an entire bomber just blowing up its entire payload in one spot right on top of you. Yes. I want that. What if... Aliens were real. And well, <laughs> we just didn't give a fuck. It's like we finally contact them and they're like all these light years away. It's like, all right, cool, they're out there. That's all we're gonna do. And like they, they do the same thing, they're like, Yeah, we're not going out there. That's way too far. And that was just it. We just like knew that there was aliens. And they knew we about us, and it was just nothing happened. That was that was the end of the conversation. That'd be pretty anticlimactic. Yeah, we but... definitely, or we could just go like the Starship Troopers route and just like cross the galaxy and just start bombing other species just for the hell of it. That would be pretty cool too, actually. But maybe even cooler than living in peace with aliens is bombing them until they're all dead. Bombing them on their softball fields. Yes. We're going to fly over with the B-52. We're going to send it out in like 20 years. It'll be there. Bombs ready to go. We're going to have we're gonna have families. We're going to have like half the crew is men, half the, the crew is women. And it's like a generation ship kind of thing. Like their sons and daughters are going to be the ones dropping the bombs. 
that's that's commitment to fucking over another sentient species yep that pretty much do it <clears throat> what kind of aliens do you like best like if they showed up tomorrow like what do you want them to look like do you want them to look like us do you want like little green men do you want like a tentacle monster I think if there's a tentacle monster there's a lot of people in Japan that would be very excited I kind of like the Nordics and you know why what, what is that it's the it's the tall like white ones that the Nazis allegedly contacted or whatever. The reason I like them is because oh, all the, the story the dark elves. You mean they're not they're not dark elves. They're like just like eight foot tall, beautiful people or whatever. The reason I like them is because when they show up in all the stories, they do one of two things: they either have sex with you, okay. or. Or I'm they uh, they basically tell you you've got to get a hold of your world before we can give you the cool technology, hmm. and those are like two not bad things. The other aliens just like to make crop circles and abduct people from their cars. That was the dumbest thing about the movie Signs was the crop circles. It's like they can travel across the galaxy. They have ships that can go invisible. And they can't navigate by just looking at the ground. It's like, oh, we need that crop circle there, or like the GPS is just not going to work, bro. I forgot about that aspect entirely. I mean, that's the name of the movie. Well, Science. yeah, I know, but the crop Without... circles were in the movie. I just didn't remember <laughs> that they were used for navigation. <laughs> I love signs, though. Yeah, I, I love that. Watched movie. it with a. With, I guess it was with Emily. I guess I don't know. Yeah, I think we watched it together. It's a good movie. It is a good movie. It's I, got I, a... I love the one like based scene with Meryl. And it's like excluding the possibility that there was a seven foot tall Scandinavian woman's high jumper on our roof last night. What are the other possibilities? <laughs> <laughs> I think Meryl was my favorite character, really. I'm insane with anger. <laughs> <laughs> That's some of the best acting. Actually, I was just thinking of this the other day. Like that's some of like the the best acting of Mel Gibson's career. Him trying to act like he doesn't know how to be crazy. Yes, beautifully like goes done. Completely against everything in his personality. I always argue that Signs is actually a Christian movie, and that if that's the case, it is the only good Christian movie in the world. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a Christian movie. I mean, the whole thing is about the a preacher finding his faith because of a bunch of coincidences. But are they coincidences or are they signs? That's the couch scene now. Which the couch scene, by the way, is an, it's an excellent scene. The whole movie rocks. I got to watch that again, damn it. I think it's on Amazon. I think it's where we watched it. Hmm. It's great. I think my parents will have it on DVD. Yeah, the soundtrack in that movie is insane. Yeah. Like yeah. when then when it really gets going towards like the climax of the movie, it's like fuck. Yeah. It's it's like hitting you right in the face. M. Night Shyamalan knows how to pick a sound like a, a soundtrack artist. Yeah. Well, I was I was every single to movie. This, um I was watching the YouTube clip of the scene where like they're holding the baby monitor in the cornfield. And somebody brought up an interesting point. Is like one, it doesn't work until all four family members are touching. Hmm. And the only other time we see that in the movie is when they're all hugging each other at the dinner table, and that's when the baby monitor lights up again. But if you if you listen to it, you can actually hear like they 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 planned it out so like the aliens are actually having a conversation. It's like, oh, the, the two of us they're, they're talking to each other. Like you can hear the normal conversation. The aliens realize they're being listened in on them getting angry and then the transmission cutting off. Hmm. Never like you noticed obviously that. you can't understand what they're saying, but like it's like normal, like click, 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 and there's a pause, and then like a bunch of like angry, like fast clicks, and then it shuts off. It's like it's cool that they thought to it thought of it to that level of detail. Like it could have just been like click 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 boom, oop, there's the end of the transmission. And nobody really would have noticed. But like the fact that you can like sit there and like pick apart that scene, it's like, oh wow, look at that. It's one of those cool little details. 
Yeah. But I will say one thing before signing off here. I cannot sit here and advocate for the sign soundtrack without advocating for the village soundtrack. Yeah. If you've never heard that, you des- you owe it to yourself to go listen to at least a couple tracks cuz it, it's incredible. Yeah. I think my favorite part of that movie is like it perfectly demonstrates like just how scary the woods is at night. Like even if you know, I mean obviously in the movie they think there's like monsters out there. But like just the fact that like they can believe that because of their preconceived fear and just like all the noises that happen in the woods can make it seem like there's an evil monster around every corner. Which if you ever and spend any time out in the woods in the pitch black, that kind of shit goes through your mind. So every every year I go camping at least once just to experience that again. Mm-hmm. It's pretty scary out there. Yeah. The woods is terrifying at night. It's like the ocean. Except you can breathe. I remember when we were in Panama for our trip and we were playing basketball. I think we were playing like horse or something like that. And like the thing was like whoever lost like had to like go running around the camp like shirtless in the dark. And so my friend loses. He takes off in the dark. I have like I'm chasing him like just like see him do it. And like we go out into the darkness into this path in this camp in Pan in the jungles in Panama, and like we stop after a while, and like we hear something growling in the underbrush, and like me and him just like look at each other like we're getting the hell out of here. And we just like sprinted back the way we came back into. The- I to this day I don't know what it is. It could have been a jaguar. It could have been you know, our imaginations. Maybe the Jersey Devil followed us all the way to Panama. There was something out there, and we weren't sticking around in the darkness to find out. I think I have seen exactly one potential cryptid in my entire life, which is more than most people. But I was at uh, Yellowstone. Okay. And I, I, I was like, what, 14 maybe? And we were looking at this bison in this field. Um, and it was, I mean, it was just a gorgeous day. And, you know, bison on the road bothering the cars and stuff. It was awesome. Yeah. But I look out across and I just see what looks like a giant rabbit. Like running across the, like hopping across this field. I mean. How giant it, are we talking about? Here? It was half the size of the bison. Okay. And it was so, so it was huge. <laughs> and I would have thought, oh, that's a cat. Like that's a, that's a weird, strange, like mountain cat. But it had giant ears that were flopping around it behind its head like a like a hair. It was crazy. Huh. I mean, the, the hairs get pretty big out there, but I don't know if it's half the size of a bison. It was huge. I mean, and we had the, the bison right there to compare it to. And I saw it. I pointed up. My brother looked over. He's like, what the heck is that? My mom saw it. Nobody else saw it, though. It was just the three of us. And... Uh, it was such it was like it was like uh wild wasteland and fallout new vegas <laughs> you could just hear that yeah. <laughs> that's such a gr- fantastic perk i honestly i wish like it wasn't a trait like i wish that was just like a setting you could put on because if you, you have to waste one of your trait slots to have wild wasteland so you're missing out on the full experience of the game I've ne- I don't think I've ever played Fallout New Vegas without that trait on. Yeah. I usually go Wild Wasteland and Skilled. And then when I go to the sink, I do Skilled again and Burden to Bear. Because Burden to Bear gives you a bunch of boost to your stats as long as you have more than 165 pounds in your inventory. And by that time in the game, you know, just your armor and you know, one gun or two alone is 165 pounds. So it's this free skill boost that would have hurt you in the beginning of the game. But when you go to the sink, you can go to the auto dock, and the auto dock will allow you to change your traits. Yeah, I've st- I've never done any of that. I've never felt like I wanted any of the other traits, but that's okay. I've played the game like ten times now, so yeah, I've I've got about eight or nine hundred hours into it at this point that's pretty pretty good game it's a fantastic game caesar's legion all the way baby speaking of fallout look at that i'm wearing the tank top 
What are the odds? Well, what are the odds? Tank top I like to wear whenever I'm on camera. I just finished uh, playing. Th- well, we just started Lonesome Road, but yeah. we're working our way through all the DLC, and my girlfriend's never seen it. Oh, what a treat! I wish I could experience it for the first time again. Yeah, she really likes uh, Eddie the robot. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, even and before he can talk, just like the fact of all, all the useful things that he can do after, like, once you come back from Lonesome Road, Eddie is just a, a beast. Just electrocuting people and shooting them with lasers, fixing your weapons, making ammo, giving you energy cells. Yeah, Eddie's the shit. Yeah, Eddie's the good. And the only thing is, he's terrible at stealth. Like, whenever you're sneaking around, like, you just get instantly spotted because Eddie's just floating behind you. Well, why would you need stealth when you have a kill bot in your yeah, pocket? Well, if you're playing on hardcore, you're trying to keep your companions alive. It's like, oh, Eddie, don't run at the desk fall nest. Just stay up here where they can't get us on these rocks that I clipped into because the game is fantastic. 10 out of 10 with no bugs. I didn't realize the, that permadeath for companions was part of hardcore. Oh, yeah. So you got to, especially if you're going to open, you got to save just in case, you know, before I mentioned death claw ambush. I saw Cass kill a Deathclaw with the double barrel shotgun. That was impressive. Ever since then, I was like, I fuck with Cass. <laughs> I mean, I always liked her just because, you know, she's got some of the best dialogue in the game. My favorite is um, it's bigger than Big Dick Johnson. You know, he had a big dick. Hence the name. <laughs> I think my favorite is the uh, the ghoul that you find on the mountain. Oh, Raw? Yeah. I never really spent much time with him. He complains too much for me. I thought he was funny, but... I usually run with um, Veronica. Which one's that? The Brotherhood of Steel one. He punches everybody. Oh, God. A Brotherhood of Steel person? Ew. You give Veronica... You can... You can literally assassinate the entire Brotherhood of Steel in front of her from stealth. And she'll still be your best friend. She's like, you're you're doing her quest. It's like, oh, I'm gonna save the Brotherhood of Steel. It's like, I got bad news for you, Veronica. They're all fucking dead. I murdered them all. I like to do it with Christine's COS silence rifle too, because mm-hmm. she was a Brotherhood member. So I like killing the, the Brotherhood from stealth with the, her rifle. That's the, one of the best guns in the game. You got a high enough sneak skill, you can literally get away with murder. Just hide and blow somebody's head off. It's like, oh, his head just evaporated. What happened? As I sneakily put my rifle in my back pocket. You didn't see anything. Yeah. All right. Well, we we got to round this out. I got to get moving here. But any last words? Oh, look, I hear plane engines overhead. I was going to say, what are you going to say? Take me now. Take me now. I want it. Cleanse want me with cleanse me with explosive fire. Joe how Biden. I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. That's the that's how today's episode. Joe Biden and a bomber taught you to love the bomb. I bet he would ride the nuke down if we asked him. A hundred percent. I feel like he would just like stumble into the bomb bay and like trip and fall on the nuke and then the nuke would just drop. <laughs> Get his shoelaces caught in the fin. Yeah. Just gets dragged out of the plane. It's like that that one movie, it's like Baby's Day Out, where like everyone keeps like tripping and falling trying to catch the baby. It's like that. He's just like sort of like like a Mr. Bean Pink Panther kind of character, just like bumbling around the bomber. Trips and falls and accidentally nukes China. That'd be a great great show. I feel like there's a potential for a sketch there. I feel like if you twist a little bit, you can make it like a Twilight Zone episode too. It's like he was the clumsiest pilot in the American air wing. And one day, he accidentally bombed Vladivostok. I was sure you were going to say your softball field. No. But... You keep <laughs> we're past the softball field there. And that was like an hour ago. You keep bringing it back. I keep trying to re-rail the off the rails. No. This, this train you cannot contain. Because it is off the rails, which <laughs> technically makes it a truck. 
the train is off the tracks it is a truck it's a truck with very very bad wheels until it crashes and then it's a train again so so there's like a brief like couple second window it's a truck (laughs) 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 and with that i'd like to say thank you once again to my good friend aaron for coming on here and doing off the rails with us uh we're work i'm working on the source review episode and i'm I'm waiting for the rest of my books of the normans to come in before i can fully go to town on writing the first episode for next season so i hope to see you guys then hopefully this extra content will hold you off and you can put all your torches and pitchforks away yes be so, nice to him podcasting can be hard especially so when I'm you late. have a real job it's mostly just me yelling at myself. Like I've gotten maybe one or two messages. Like, where's the podcast? The rest of it sits in my head. Oh, I know. I know. I have a, I have a, a courtroom full of accusers in my head too. And I think I've gotten one bad message yeah. ever. Yeah. So if you haven't, you should check out Aaron's show. We talk about dead people. Uh, if you scroll far enough, you'll find some stuff that him and I did together. Uh, personal favorite, uh, the mutant Ninja Turtles episode will forever be top five we talk about dead people episodes and for those of you who go yes it's been a while since we posted but that's because my co-host got married um and he's currently moving into his new place and all of that good stuff so and i might be on there you know we, him and i Aaron and i are supposed to do an episode sometime so it's true this is true peeled yes neil's, neil's coming the ultimate cr- <laughs> the old comment <laughs> I'm going to hang up on this call. <laughs> uh, this is, will be on YouTube, too. So if you want to catch all this visual on the back end, subscribe, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Good night.